Good evening and welcome everyone to, to this lecture on Water on Mars, given by Michael Carr for the Herschel Society and the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution. My name is Tony Symes and I organise lectures for the Herschel Society. Please be aware that this lecture is being recorded. As always, I do ask you to observe etiquette to double check that you're on mute and your video is off during the lecture. You can turn them back on again for the Q&A session afterwards. In fact, I can hear someone uh, who's unmuted at the moment. Please could you mute yourself? Uh, if you ha have a question, the best way of dealing of dealing with it is to put it into the chat channel and that you can do that at any time. We'll deal with questions after the lecture. Uh, you can always, after the lecture, you can try raising your hand, but given the number of people, I may not see it. Now, in keeping with our current Mars theme, the next lecture planned for the Herschel Society and the BRLSI will be on Friday the 4th of February. It will be given by Steve Clifford, with the title, The Possible Hydrologic Cycle of a Cold Early Mars, and it will be linked to this lecture. But you don't have to wait until February, as there are other good things coming up this month and next. First, we have the Caroline Herschel Prize Lecture, which will be given by this year's winner, Dr. Jenny Carter of the University of Leicester, on Thursday the 18th of November at 7 p.m., with the title, Earth versus Sun, a precarious relationship in space. This is online only and tickets are free, but you need to register via the events page on the Herschel Society website. Then coming to Bath Abbey, there's the Museum of the Moon, which is a spectacular installation with related activities for the whole family from 20th of November to 24th of December. The details of this are on the Bath Abbey website, bathabbey.org. And lastly, I'd like to mention the BRLSI's Victor Suchar Christmas Lecture. It's online only on Thursday the 16th of December at 7.30 p.m. And this is not an astronomical lecture, but I'm recommending it because it's been given by the Astronomer Royal, Lord Martin Rees. He'll be talking about the future for humanity. Details are on the BRLSI's website. Back to tonight's lecture. Michael Carr is by any account the Dean of Planetary Geologists and has been since Apollo and the first Mars orbiters. He's a native of Leeds and received a BSc from University College London in 1956 and a PhD from Yale in 1960, both in geology. He did a postdoc at the University of Western Ontario, where he began research into shock waves that are produced in rocks by impacts directly related, uh, directly relevant to understanding the craters on the moon. He was recruited by Gene Shoemaker to join the US Geological Survey in 1962 in Menlo Park, California, where he still lives nearby. His observations at the Lick Observatory contributed to the first geologic maps of the moon. He first started working on Mars in 1970 after joining the Mariner 9 imaging team. Subsequently, between 76 and 80, as leader of the Viking Orbiter imaging team, he supervised the acquisition of 55,000 images of Mars. He was also involved with every following Mars mission until he retired in 2004. He's written over 200 papers on Mars and three books. May I hand you over to Michael Carr. Uh, good afternoon. So there's the, there's the title. And first what I'm going to do is, uh, if I can get this working, I, <clears throat> oh, there we go, is, uh, talk about a few uh, basic facts of Mars. The area, land area of Mars is equivalent to the, to the uh, land area of, of the Earth, to give you some idea of how much terrain we're talking about. Now, Mars is cold 
as you all know, it's the distance from the sun is 1.5 AU. The daily mean temperature at the equator, minus 60 degrees centigrade, and it's pretty cold at the pole, minus 120 at the poles, 120 uh, degrees centigrade, compared with the uh, south pole of the Earth, at minus 48 C. So it's, it's cold. The spin axis tilts 25 degrees, so it's pretty similar to the Earth. But as I'll show later, this has changed quite dramatically throughout history. Now, they are, uh, uh, throughout the geologic history, the atmosphere is thin, hundreds of the Earth, and it's mostly carbon dioxide, which condenses on the uh, polar caps. Uh, and, uh, and those caps retreat and advance uh, with, the, uh, with the seasons. Now, I'm going to uh, just outline briefly here the geography of Mars. This is from about, this is a Makeda projection from about 65 north to 65 south. And you can, the, the, the red, yellow, and white colors are all high, and the blue and the green are low. The, the southern hemisphere, as you can see, is higher than the northern hemisphere, and that's been termed the global dichotomy. And a stride that global dichotomy is a high area called Tharsis. Now you can see even at this, on this uh, scale, that the high areas of the Southern hemisphere are very heavily cratered, indicating that they date back to the very earliest uh, of Mars's history. Whereas the plains in the North are only sparsely cratered being uh, much, much younger. I'm going to focus uh, much of the talk around this, around this, around this area. And it's called the Chrissy, Chrissy Basin. This is a, a view from above the Chrissy Basin, and that's the North Pole. And again, the same color scheme that we had on the uh, on the previous slide. This is a cross section from the South Pole on the left to the North Pole on the south, this being the surface. And this diagram is taken from Steve Clifford, who is going to give a talk uh, uh, next February, as, uh, as we just heard. Now, in the present, at the present day, Mars is very cold, and it has a kilometers thick cryosphere. That is, it, the ground is permanently frozen to kilometers depth much deeper, of course, at the poles than, uh, than at the equator, but still kilometers thick cryosphere at the equator. Below that cryosphere, there is probably groundwater. And uh, that, that relationship between this permanently frozen ground and the groundwater below is going to be a prominent part of the water, water story. So this is a preview of the of the talk. Early Mars may have been warm and wet with an Earth-like hydrologic system. The surface subsequently became cold and dry with a kilometer thick permanently frozen cryosphere. Then around three to 3.5 billion years ago, there were massive eruptions of groundwater below the cryosphere to form ocean-sized, probably mostly frozen bodies of water. And most of the water was subsequently lost to space over the last few billion years. Now, almost every aspect of this story is uh, controversial. So what I'm going to give is my take, but there, but as I, as I say, there are major, major controversies and whole meetings have been held with people shouting at one another across the room on, on Many of these, many of these bullets that you just saw. So I, I mentioned dates, and the dates that we have, since we don't have birth samples from known locations, the dates are based on craters. Very early, until about 3.8 billion years ago, the cratering rate was very high, and surfaces with numerous craters such as this date back to that time. We don't. 
we don't, uh, it's very difficult. This is almost saturated with craters and you can't really date surfaces that are older than that 3.8 because because the uh, as new craters form they destroy old craters and the crater density remains about the same younger younger surfaces are only sparsely cratered and you can date them uh, quite well with uh, just by counting counting craters now we'll get now into the water story that old cratered terrain dating back to 3.8 billion years ago is almost everywhere, at least in low latitudes, dissected by river, uh, by valleys, presumably river valleys. And this is, uh, this is uh, one example. Oops. There's another example of, uh, of this dissected terrain. And here we show a map of those valleys, a map made by, uh, by Heineck at the University of Colorado. And you can see that the, 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 everywhere in that old terrain, old cratered terrain, there are, there are river valleys. Some of the valleys are, are, are over 2000 kilometers here, you can see one here, here and so on. But this pattern is very different from the uh, uh, an Earth-like pattern. On Earth, of course, uh, drainage drainage basins grow as they capture valleys from the, from neighboring basins, and the uh, the drainage the rivers uh, ultimately end up uh, taking the precipitation and dumping it in the ocean. Well, that that apparently has not happened on Mars because you don't see large river, river basins uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, individual rivers extending into the low areas, which are mostly to the north here. Whatever, whatever uh, caused uh, this precipitation, it, uh, it, did not, it was not sufficiently sustained so that these large, large drainage basins uh, that we have on Earth or, uh, developed. So most of the valleys end in local local lows, and if they <clears throat> and so to summarize what I just said, most of the heavily cratered terrain is dissected by branching valleys. The 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 valleys are rare in sparsely cratered terrain, that is younger terrain. Large basins did not develop, but individual valleys may be over two thousand kilometers long. If oceans were present, as may be required to provide the precipitation, they were probably fed mostly by groundwater and not, and not rivers. Now, among, also in these, um, <clears throat> in these heavily cratered uh, terrains, there are numerous uh, lakes, numerous lakes formed, as, as you would expect from this uh, immature drainage system in which most of the drainage is into local lows. And here I'm showing one, uh, 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 something that one sees in many of these lakes is, that is, a, um, is a delta. The, uh, the water came in from the bottom here and uh, the uh, sediment load was dumped into a into into a basin, forming forming a, a delta. Some of the craters, some of the uh, lakes are in impact craters. This one has a water coming in from the south, and uh, overflowed, and uh, formed a channel out to the north, and leaving behind a a, a, a bathtub ring. This image on the right is uh, is of the sediments of the sediments in within uh, within one of these uh, one of these uh, craters that's been that's been partly eroded away, and you can see the fine layering in the sediments uh, inside in, in the lake. And this is fairly common in these old old lakes, and it's probably this rhythmic sedimentation we also see at the poles, which I shall talk about later, 
and is indicative probably of uh, that these whatever whatever was causing the erosion and the deposition within the lakes, it was affected in some way by astronomical, periodic astronomical uh, 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 motions. So lakes are common. Some of inlets and outlets indicating the inflow rates exceeded evaporation and infiltration. And others have only inlets. Deltas are common. And as we, as we know from the news today, lakes are favored sites of exploration because of the potential for harboring a, a life. This is a sort of a cartoon of Jezero Crater, the crater in which Perseverance has landed earlier this year. There's a, a valley coming in on the left here, uh, leaving a, uh, a delta. And there was an out, there's an outflow on this crater going off, going off to the right. This, uh, this line shows the, uh, the shore of the former crater when that outflow was, uh, 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 was working. And the uh, blue area outlines the floor of the present uh, crater. So this is a close-up of the uh, of uh, where Jezero landed in this region here, and you can see you can see the the, uh, the delta delta quite well, and this this delta has um, has apparently been eroded back. It was probably much larger than it is uh, than it is now, and there are remnants of the uh, outliers of the, of the delta that have been left after the after it was eroded back it what uh, what uh, perseverance will ultimately do is try is move across this uh, these uh, these sediments or it, they could even be lava flows in the bottom of the crater up to the up to the uh, <clears throat> uh, edge of the delta and hopefully manage to climb up through the sequence of rocks that uh, fo that form the delta. The different colors here are um, differences in composition, as as observed uh, from from orbit. The perseverance has not had time to really do much exploration yet. However, to th in the uh, curiosity, another lander set down in Gale Crater in 2009 and has since been exploring uh, exploring various elements of the of the crater it landed in this uh, in this corner here in the flat area which is an achievement in itself because the error, uh, error because of the error in landing, it's difficult to slip spacecraft landers into areas, small areas like this. But there's a, a valley that cut, cuts through the rim, and you can see it here. And the uh, this whatever river cut this uh, channel, it uh, it deposited deposits in the flat area of the crater floor here. Now, on the, um, in the middle of the crater is a mound, which we call Mount Sharp. And uh, uh, composed of, uh, of, uh, of layered sediments. And what, what Curiosity has done in the 10 years, 11 years or so that it's been here, is, is moved across the, um, across the, crater, the crater floor here and then has been marching up the up the side of Mount uh, Mount Sharp, encountering younger and younger uh, sediments. So what did uh, what did uh, Curiosity found <coughs> find? Mm -hmm. Well, at the base of Mount Sharp is a series of deltaic and lacustrian sediments, with grain sizes ranging from clays to conglomerates. The deposits uh, date from that fluvial era that ended around 3.7, 3.8 billion years ago. The deposits accumulated episodically over a long period of time in which habitable conditions uh, prevailed within the, uh, within the lake. 
Uh, it's, it's very difficult uh, on a remote planet to, to know exactly how long it has, take, has taken to accumulate a sequence of sediments that one might encounter. And there had been estimates made on the basis of uh, structures seen in the, in the sediments that, and analogies with the earth to, that this, these deposits uh, could have accumulated, these lacustrine uh, uh, deposits could have accumulated over many millions of years. But it's somewhat, um, it, this is somewhat fuzzy because of, it's based on terrestrial analogies, analogs. Now the water lane sediments were later partly eroded away and then overlain by aeolian deposits, which form most of that big mound in the middle of the crater. And, and curiosity is now in these, uh, in these um, Aeolian sediments at the, uh, up, the, up the side of, uh, of Mount Sharp. So let me just summarize what, um, what I've uh, so far. There's compelling geologic evidence of warm, wet conditions on early Mars with abundant water, which suggests a hydrological cycle with evaporation, large bodies of water, possibly oceans, precipitation, surface runoff and return to the oceans. Now, I mentioned that there are no large rivers uh, transporting the precipitation into, the, into those, uh, those low areas. And the they, uh, they return is pro probably via groundwater. However, <clears throat> climate models, uh, now to have oceans, one has to have a mean, a mean annual temperatures that's uh, zero degrees centigrade or above. However, climate models indicate the mean annual temperature early, early Mars must have been well below zero centigrade because of the faint young sun. And these models have tried various pressures, various mixes of greenhouse gases, and they, know, and they have not been able to uh, come up with a mix of greenhouse gases and, and pressures and so forth that would enable uh, uh, long-lived oceans and, and rainfall. This is a major, major uh, disconnect between the, uh, the atmospheric uh, um, people studying atmospheres and the geologists studying the, uh, uh, what I've just described. There's some disconnect here, which is, which is currently unresolved. There's some possibilities. One is, of course, that the climate models or the assumptions that come into those climate models have some fundamental flaw. And that uh, semi-permanent warm Earth-like conditions with oceans actually did prevail. That's, that's the opinion of most geologists. There's another, uh, another uh, model, it's called the Icy Highlands model, which uh, supposes that the highlands, uh, which is supposed to be a thicker atmosphere, and that the ice accumulated on the highlands because of, the, because of adiabatic cooling with elevation, and that melting occurred episodically, and locally under anomalous warm conditions such as noon at midsummer. This analogy is based in part on what one sees in Antarctica where one can get quite vigorous uh, rivers forming uh, episodically under the ice, even though the mean annual temperatures are well below freezing. A third possibility is that large impacts or large volcanic eruptions temporarily and episodically changed the global conditions and permitted short but vigorous fluvial events. What's going for this is that as the, where they, when the impact rates declined, then so did the uh, rate of valley formation. There's a correlation there. And um, uh, there, are, there are issues, issues involved with that, uh, with that particular model. Also, so I'm going to step a little forward now after the end of the, that vigorous fuel episode that we've been speaking of so far. 
Opportunity landed in 2004. This was not a very elaborately uh, instrumented uh, lander, a much more simple one than the ones that we are, than Curiosity or Perseverance that have followed subsequently. And it landed in, uh, in this in a region called Mer Meridiani. And you can see around the periphery of this, uh, this uh, lower right-hand slide, the ancient crater terrain, large craters, but it's been overlain, as you can see, by a smoother, smooth deposit, which is only sparser crater. It appears to, it appears to have landed in a in a uh, sequence of uh, rocks that are that formed after the decline, the, the, the major decline of the valley networks, and this is a sequence that you can see in the uh, in the uh, that that it, that it saw. In, in 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 the wall of a crater, and it consists of consists of um, mixture of uh, fluvial and aeolian sediments and evaporites. So there's water involved, and there was wind involved in the, in the dep deposition of this uh, of this sequence. Now you this this is a uh, Probably a, a, a slide that difficult for you to uh, see what's going on here, but this is, these are indicators of groundwater movement through the stack of sediments that I just that I just showed. These indicators are rather subtle. Uh, however, one one can see in the upper left corner here of the left uh, slide uh, concretions. That have grown after the deposition of the uh, of the of the rock because they distort the uh, the uh, original bedding, and in the bottom right here you can see uh, molds of minerals that have been dissolved out. Now, what this, uh, what how this is, is interpreted is that it's thought to uh, the uh, those concretions and moles are thought to be due to, due to movement of groundwater through the uh, through the sequence after some time after it had been deposited, and the the the, the interpretation uh, 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 of opportunities that it landed in a sequence of. Aeolian and evaporite deposits that formed in a desert with dunes and ephemeral interdune acidic saline ponds, ponds, probably fed episodically by groundwater. So you have uh, fluctuating groundwater and pliers or evaporite, evaporitic lakes between the, between the dunes. And these deposits, oops, these deposits formed early after the main fluvial episode was over, but while there was still shallow groundwater, that is, there was uh, no, no cryosphere at this time, apparently. Now, now I'm gonna go on to a totally, totally different kind of a fluvial feature. Uh, features formed by enormous floods rather than just the modest, uh, modest uh, 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 currents that formed those uh, channels that we've been talking about so far. This is one of, the one of the larger of these floods. Now to give you dimensions of this, uh, of this you can see, well, you can see all the streamlined islands and the general streamline formed. There's very little doubt that this was formed by uh, some sort of uh, fluid flowing over the, over the surface and eroding into that surface. In terms of size, they, from left to right in this uh, is, 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 is the distance is further than from Dover to Aberdeen. It's the whole of Britain could have, could have sat within this, uh, within, this, uh, uh, within this channel. These channels, these flood features are really enormous. So where, how could, where do they come from? Well, if you, if you, if you go, Follow it upstream to the source, and that's down below the side. This is what you find. This is the source of that channel that I just showed you. It, it, it starts in a closed depression. 
and there's no 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 valleys or no big valleys running into it the water seemingly just came out of the ground and here's another example a much smaller example this is uh, the scale at the bottom here the incident the scale here is 50 this is about 100 kilometers across the scale here this is about 40 kilometers across up at the, in the middle of the slide here and this this valley started at a fault you can see the fault very clearly here uh, uh, it just starts full size and uh, uh, the water seemingly just came out of, out of the ground. Here's a, yet another quite well-known uh, example. You have a 40 kilometer uh, depression filled with rubble and out of it comes a, comes a, 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 a flood that's eroded eroded this uh, channel here. So these large floods, <clears throat> they formed after that fluvial era uh, was, uh, was over. And the surface of the planet had cooled and a kilometer thick permafrost had developed. They formed about th three to 3.5 billion years ago, seemingly by massive eruptions of groundwater trapped below the kilometer thick permafrost. The floodwaters pooled in low areas, <clears throat> uh, such as the big crater Hellas in the Southern Hemisphere and the uh, Northern Plains in the, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. The, the, the floods at this time probably formed oceanside bodies of water, but they ra probably rapidly froze because it was, if they did indeed form form at a time when there was a thick cryosphere, a thick permafrost, the uh, global temperatures were well below freezing and the floodwaters uh, almost certainly rapidly, rapidly froze. Now this, the canyons are part of this uh, flood story. They, uh, this, is a, this is an image that's about as wide as the United States. And uh, it shows these equatorial, equatorial canyons that are formed mostly by, by faulting, but, have, but that have been secondary enlargement by landsliding and, uh, and some even possibly by fluvial erosion. They, in, the, in the center of that image, they, one can see, here, here we see some detail, in the middle of the uh, canyons that are stacked stacks of lead deposits uh, through here, up, up in Close Canyon up here. And um, these, uh, these uh, uh, are a puzzle because it's, there are no, um, no rivers uh, coming into the canyons to dump the, uh, dump the sediments. How did, they, how did they accumulate? So the, these canyons merge eastward with large channels that drain into the Chrissy Basin, the part of that northern basin that, uh, uh, that um, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier. This suggests that the canyons once contained lakes. Now the canyons form mostly by faulting and were enlarged by other processes. Now the faults may have provided access of groundwater to the to the surface, like one of the images that I showed earlier, where you see a fault, a, a fairly sizable channel, uh, starting at a at a at a fault. And it, it, here we see the relationship between the canyons. Uh, along the, uh, and then the, the canyons merge eastward into large large valleys, which uh, which curve curve northward into the into the northern basin. The uh, the Kasai Valley today, the first flood that I, that I showed is is uh, here, and there are large valleys that. Um, all, uh, <clears throat> that go into the northern basin that also started at rubble filled holes. So they, there's a there's a, a convergence of of, a, of several different kinds of uh, flood features into this uh, northern basin 
in this case, the Chrissy Basin. Now, if we look down at the, uh, at the Northern Basin, this is a view looking down from the north. Uh, in the center is the, um, is the North Pole itself. And these, um, these contours outline, uh, this one outlines the uh, spillway here between this and a, a subsidiary basin. And this contour outlines the, um, the uh, spillway between two, two bases within the, within the larger Northern Basin. You can, the Chrissy, Chrissy area that I showed with all the, with all the, the is, is down at the bottom here. Kasai Valis is here, the one, the major one. So these uh, valleys converge on the Northern Basin. Now what I'm gonna show next is a region over into the upper right here. You see a, 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 the edge of the edge of the basin in the upper right. And this doesn't seem, doesn't look very spectacular, but what it shows is a, an albedo, a texture boundary uh, that uh, at the edge of the basin. If you follow this boundary, wait a minute, this this boundary is uh, at a uniform elevation for 2,800 kilometers. It's the same exact elevation for 2,800 kilometers. What else could it be but a shoreline? It's, uh, it, it, there's no other geologic process that I can think of anyway that would uh, create such a sharp boundary over, over such, a, such a length at a constant elevation. The same boundary on the opposite side of the planet. Here we see that Kasai Valis again, and the uh, the other valleys coming in from the south, and it it, uh, it coincides with the number of uh, a number of <clears throat> uh, cliff-like features around the around the Chrissy Basin. So, <clears throat> in Elysium, the ground slopes gently northward into the northern basin, and, uh, and this the boundary extends along the edge of the basin at a constant elevation of 30, minus 6, 3650 meters. And on the opposite side of the planet, the same boundary outlines streamlined islands and, uh, uh, and the boundary between the heavily cratered and sparsely cratered plains. So it's interpreted as marking the shore of a, of a northern ocean. I, I've mentioned this, the contour probably marks the high water mark of the last large flood into the northern basin. And it's not, not the level of the flood during that early, early era of valley formation that I, uh, that I discussed earlier. And the crater dating suggests an age of around 3 to 3.5 uh, billion years old. So, these floods, which poured into the northern basin, would have pooled and rapidly frozen if at that time Mars had a thick cryosphere, thick permafrost, as appears likely. And if true, then the, this minus 3650 contour encloses an ocean of lead ice deposits, not a liquid ocean. And the volume enclosed is equivalent to a global equivalent layer of 110 meters thick. For comparison, a similar figure for the Earth is 3.4 kilometers at global equivalent there. That is, if all the water was spread evenly over the whole planet, the whole planet, it would be 110 meters thick. So where is that water now? That's, <clears throat> well, one place that we know there's lots of water is in the polar ice caps. And this is a this is a picture looking down on the north North Polar cap, and it's composed mostly of water ice and um, <clears throat> and, and dust. What I show here in the, in the le on the left is profiles across the South Pole and the North Pole, and it um, from which we can get the volume of the um, of the ice because. There's no ice out here at the edges, and you can you can 
<clears throat> from the from the profiles derive a, a volume ice volume of about 20 meters gel of water ice the um <clears throat> these lead de these deposits at the pole are very finely layered and it's thought that um <clears throat> that the layering has been controlled by uh, or modulated by uh, by uh, variations, particularly in the obliquity, the tilt of the of the, uh, of the uh, axis of the planet, and that's that's uh, that has affected the rate of deposition of dust and ice, and possibly formation of dust storms and so forth. So that uh, you, wherever you look, uh, you see these thin uh, these. Uh, Thinly, thinly bedded uh, ice, ice rich uh, sediments. So I mentioned obliquity, obliquity uh, a few times, and obliquity I think holds the clue to where the where the water went. Mm -hmm. This is a projection backward from the, from the present day uh, about ten million years and shows the variation in obliquity uh, over the, over that time. Now. The predicting how the variation of liquidity over longer periods of time is uh, is not possible because of the chaotic nature of the obliquity. But Monte Carlo, this last car now, <clears throat> 2004, they did Monte Carlo simulations to, to see what the distribution of obliquities might have been over geologic time. And the, the present obliquity is 25 degrees, but the average obliquity over time is 40, 40 degrees. And the, it, there's even a 60% chance of reaching 60 degrees in, in, in 1 billion years. So you can imagine what happens. The, the axis is tilted over and as Earth goes around the sun, um, the, uh, there are very, uh, very large seasonal, uh, seasonal changes. At low obliquities, ice is stable at the caps at both poles, but in high obliquity, the summer pole is, is continuously illuminated for a Mars year. Remember, that's about one Earth year, half a Mars year, that's about one Earth year. And the winter pole is in, in, is in the dark for, for half a Mars year. So water sublimates from the summer pole and is transferred to the winter pole. And the young age of the polar deposits seemingly because there are no craters on those, uh, on those polar deposits, it probably comes from erasure or almost clean, complete erasure of the polar deposits at the most recent high obliquities. As a side, obliquities greater than 55 degrees that ice may accumulate in the equatorial, uh, equatorial uh, regions. Now, in addition to the polar caps, there's evidence for ice around the polar caps at lower latitudes. And this is, the, here we see two examples. You can see on this picture on the left, uh, a cliff uh, from which, from which, uh, which uh, the debris, whatever ice uh, has uh, flowed, ice rich debris has flowed away from the cliff and into uh, into the low areas uh, to the to, to the bottom of the picture. And similarly, here we see flow of ice uh, from a uh, from a uh, one crater one crater into another. There are other indicators of ice at the uh, ice near the surface in the areas around the uh, around the poles around those polar layer deposits. Ice was found at the Phoenix landing site, the 68 North in 2008. You can see ice around fresh impact craters. And the, uh, I mentioned the abundant glacier-like flows of the surface, but orbital ground penetrating radar suggests there's a presence of 50 to 100% ice to depths of 80 meters, the equivalent of five to 10 meters global equivalent layer. So we have a, uh, a little, a little of the uh, missing missing ice may be uh, in these uh, peripheral areas around the uh, around the uh, layered terrain. 
water formed at the, uh, at the surface to form an ocean is unlikely to be at depth 80, 80 meters because of the difficulty of permeating down through the permafrost. So this may be, this is a relevant, the relevant um, uh, water if we're searching for where the water from the ocean uh, oceans went. So, at, at equatorial latitudes, there's probably very little ice in equatorial latitudes because uh, ice is unstable at all depths uh, under present conditions and also under conditions that range up to the uh, up to uh, well up to 55 degree 55 degrees uh, uh, of liquidities. Now, there are occasional indicators of ice may indicate. Uh, in remnants of ice from earlier periods of high obliquity. So there's, there's probably less than five meters global equivalent layer in, in the equatorial, equatorial area. But to summarize that, we'll, we have a volume of global ocean is 110 meters. We know where about 30 to 35 meters is, 80 to 85 meters uh, is, is, uh, is probably, is, is missing. So where did that 80 to 85 meters of global equivalent there uh, go? We now have measures of losses to space. There are gases are lost to space by interaction of solar wind with the upper atmosphere. Uh, the Earth is largely protected, but Mars was mostly unprotected since there's no magnetic field for most of its history. The present loss rates of hydrogen would remove three to 24 meters gel over 4 billion years and the oxygen about 15 meters. So present loss rates are inadequate to explain the losses that we infer the 85 meters uh, missing uh, 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 th that we referred to above. There's some clue as to uh, the amount of uh, the losses that have taken place in the uh, deuterium to hydrogen enrichment of the remaining the water near the surface today. Hydrogen <clears throat> is lost preferentially to deuterium uh, because of differential <clears throat> diffuser diffuser separation at the top of the atmosphere. And this leaves the near surface water enriched in deuterium. <clears throat> Initially, Earth and Mars are the same D2H, which is referred to as SMO, <laughs> standard mean ocean water. The 3.8 billion year clay is a, uh, clay is a, a Gale crater have been in a, a, a D2H, which is enriched three times SMO. So, Already by the time of the formation of those sediments at Gale Crater, Mars had lost a significant fraction of its original inventory. But the present value of the water of the DWH in the atmosphere is uh, twice that of in, uh, in Gale Crater. So there's been, if, if that um, water in the atmosphere is representative of the near surface inventory, then, uh, the, uh, in, then there has been significant loss uh, from the, um, uh, from the to space. Now, the present atmospheric DWH is probably representative of the 30 meters of gel <coughs> in the surface uh, inventory, because the, the Young, the polar depart, ice deposits are young, which suggests that they were erased in geologically recent times, probably at high obliquity. And there's a seasonal transfer of ice from pole to pole at high obliquities. So the atmosphere is probably representative of the, um, of the near surface inventory. <clears throat> and uh, from, the, from that, we can make estimates of the uh, 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 of the amount uh, uh, of loss and test for consistency with uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, with the um, with the DDH. So, the higher the obliquity, 
the higher the hydrogen deuterium loss as water is transferred from pole to pole, uh, as the season become more vigorous and the water content of the atmosphere increases. So the average obliquity over time is higher than at present. So the present loss rates were probably not representative of the past loss rates. Loss of, losses of oxygen are more difficult to assess, but it's sensitive to the high EUV flux. And, and the, uh, the Jacoskin uh, suggests that solar wind losses could have, could have been substantial in the past. So the present day loss rates, although very low, are not fatal to the uh, former presence of oceans. And much of the former 110 meters uh, global equivalent layer of water was probably lost during periods of high obliquity. I come now, come, so that's, uh, that's basically the story. So let me just summarize quickly here. Around 3.8 billion years ago, there was widespread fluvial erosion, the presence of lakes, and which suggests climatic conditions, warm climatic conditions, but how warm, how sustained, and how those conditions came about particularly remain unclear. The planet subsequently developed a kilometer thick cryosphere, three to 3.5 Billion years ago, there were massive eruptions of groundwater from beneath the cryosphere. They resulted in large floods and an ocean containing 110 meter global equivalent layer in the northern plains that rapidly, rapidly froze. Although the present loss rates fall far short of those needed, most of the ocean water was subsequent loss of space leaving the remaining service inventory enriched in deuterium. And the losses were probably mainly during the periods of higher obliquity when the water content at the atmosphere was higher and than at present because of the enhanced seasonal transfer of water uh, between the poles. So that's, uh, that's the uh, story in brief. And I'll stop here and um, take questions. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Um, we'll go straight into the questions in that case. And uh, first in with a question is uh, Deepali Gaskell. Who, uh, Deepali, do you want to unmute and ask your question? I'll give so, you a moment. Yeah. Carry sure, on. My question actually was about the origin of the water uh, that may have been on Mars. How was it created? Well, the um, yes, uh, the uh, all the planets uh, condensed from a uh, from a, uh, a nebula cloud, and the the planets uh, in so doing uh, uh, incorporated different different amounts of volatile materials. And uh, one would expect, uh, to, as going further out in the solar system, that the further out one would get uh, more, uh, uh, more, uh, 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 well, the, 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 excuse me, <laughs> you would have more water on the planets as you further go out, as you go out further from the sun. I don't know whether that answers your question, but uh, it, the uh, the original planet incorporated, just like the Earth, incorporated uh, volatiles, not just water, but other kinds of volatiles, and the planets uh, incorporated different uh, different uh, proportions of volatiles according to where they are in the solar system. So, um, so am I right in concluding that um, the water that exists on Earth and Mars possibly Venus, were actually introduced to, the, to these planets via um, um, objects, flying objects that came in from outer, re outer farther out. Yes, I mean, there's a uh, the cometary material. There's, there's somewhat, the, 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 when the water was acquired by the Earth, uh, somewhat controversial, 
in 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 the sense that there was uh, and the moon in the sense that there was a uh, there may have been a late a late acquisition of cometary material from uh, further out in the in the in the in the solar system at a, at a very late stage and uh, that may be where most of the water comes from but it could have also in part from the original accretion of the uh, of the earth and the moon and mars Right. Um, let's have a question from Peter then. Uh, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yes, good evening, uh, Dr. Carr, or good, good afternoon, as it probably is for you. Um, there was a lot of water flowing out uh, through the northern outflow channels from Aries Vallis and Shalbatana uh, Vallis through to Acidalia. What would you have expected the depth of water to be? Well, that's one of the big uncertainties. Uh, it's very difficult to uh, assess the discharge rates, not knowing the depth. And um, so the calculations of the discharges of these, uh, these that were involved in formation of large channels uh, vary according to what depths are assumed. The, the, so I, I can't answer your question because we really have no um, no good way of measuring. There have been attempts by trailing by tracing the uh, scour lines over over hummocks and so on, and uh, and um, obstacles in the channel to get some minimum depths, but. Uh, but it's really um, you're asking a question that really has not been uh, has not been resolved, and it's essential in order to in order to estimate this discharge rates. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, to Chris Pullen, then. Uh, I very much enjoyed that talk, Michael. I'm just a simple geologist, so I tend to uh, stand by observations rather than models. And it would seem to me that there's very clear evidence of a lot of water there uh, very early on. And that would imp imply, surely, an atmosphere and a reasonably thick atmosphere to have decent temperatures at, at ground level. Uh, I, I'm thinking very much of the work of uh, Ned Nikoloff, who showed that, you know, there's a clear relationship between atmosphere pressures and, and surface temperatures. Do you not think that to be the case, that actually what's happened is you've lost the atmosphere and that's the big change? Yes, I, I, I agree. I agree that you, the geologic evidence is just totally, totally compelling of, of uh, water, you know, lots and lots of water and modest, modest size streams. So there's some fundamental, fundamental flaw in the uh, in the uh, in the calculations of what those um, what the uh, temperatures could be. Uh, with various uh, under various pressures and um, and uh, mixes of, uh, of, uh, of greenhouse gases. And however, I am, I am struck by the correlation between the number of channels, or the density of dissection, and the number of craters. There's some connection between the heavy bombardment and the formation of those of those valleys, I, I feel, and um, it, it it could be that what we're seeing is a combination of a thicker atmosphere, as you suggest, with lots of greenhouse gases, but large impacts perturbing the the system temporarily to allow uh, to allow uh water water to uh, flow despite the calculations of the um, of the that, that there have been made on the uh, on surface temperatures from purely atmospheric effects it may be that there's a combination of an atmospheric effect and impacts right uh, marcus hope um 
I'm looking at your question. I'm uh, yes. Compa- well, compa- well, your comparison with Jupiter's icy moons, but um, but you put your question. Yes. Um, well, this may be totally off the wall. Um, I'm still not quite clear where the sub surface water from Mars came from? Did it sort of soak through from the surface? And that's why I wondered whether there's any value in looking at ice, Jupiter's icy moons, because they obviously will represent a state which is much colder than the, the, even Mars is now. Um, and it may be that Mars could have been similar in an early part of its history, then warmed up and the water sort of, you know, came, uh, soaked into the planet. Um, is there any, any, uh, anything to suggest that that might be the case? I, I'm trying to understand what, <laughs> understand the, uh, the model that you're suggesting. Um, well, uh, we had a, sorry, go on, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I, I, are you suggesting that if you have a, a silicate, silicate, the main body of Mars covered in ice? Is that what you're suggesting? Well, I was just wondering, because, I mean, you have the icy moons of Jupiter not only have an icy covering, but they uh, uh, supposedly have uh, water below the surface, quite a long way below the surface. Um, well, not, uh, yeah, I, uh, not quite I, I don't see the, I don't see the um, necessity for invoking that kind of a model from Mars. Mm-hmm. Um, it, that that, uh, that Mars initial inventory could have been uh, could have been substantial of, of water. Why would it be different from the Earth? It's not that much further out. It's not like we're out in the outer solar system. And I would think its acquisition is uh, is similar to the its initial acquisition of water is similar to the Earth. And I did mention this late heavy bombardment of cometary material, which mm. should have, uh, could have added substantially to its initial inventory. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, right. Let's go to Roger Moses then. Yeah, you mentioned at the beginning that uh, um, the, all the features of the presumed history are pretty strongly <coughs> contested. What are the main features of alternative models? Let me, well, I assume you mean the alternative models for the early warm, wet Mars. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the the icy highlands model, uh, let me elaborate a little on that. Mm. What, this is a, a model that's been being promoted by Jim Head of Brown University, and what he what he, he he's worked with some atmospheric people, and they they suggest that with a thicker atmosphere, uh, the temperature of the surface uh, would be controlled by elevation, just as it is on Earth through adiabatic cooling. Higher 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 areas would be colder, and as a consequence that ice would accumulate in, um, in, uh, uh, on the highlands where we see all those valleys. And <clears throat> he, he, they suggest that with temperatures well below freezing, say, say minus 30 uh, centigrade, minus, uh, 40, uh, minus 30 centigrade, they, um, <clears throat> Globally, even in that situation, you want, one could get anomalous periods of warmer temperatures locally, such as a, say at uh, high noon, and, uh, and and get melting of the ice, and, the, and so you have subglacial uh, rivers that cut those uh, cut those. Uh, valleys, even though the global average temperature was well below freezing. Now, with, with that model, the only way you could have an ocean, uh, well, you, you, you almost could not have an ocean uh, because uh, to sustain a liquid ocean on the, on the, on the planet, you, would, uh, you have to have temperatures that are at least, uh, uh, global averages of at least uh, 
uh, free, uh, yeah, about freezing. The other, the other model, the other model is an impact model, and it, what, what, uh, the, the, this is uh, Tune and his associates at Colorado. What they suggest is that large impacts would, would eject massive amounts of hot material up into the atmosphere and even into orbit and temporarily raise the surface temperature and thus, uh, thus on a water rich planet enable, enable melting of ice and formation of, uh, of those river valleys. So that's a, so that's a, so that's a, different, uh, a different kind of a, a, a model. So, mm. so in the icy highlands, you would expect glaciation and glaciers to form with the water flowing underneath. Well, it depends on how. Yeah. So well, there are see... there are you know there are local indications. That I, I I I showed a couple of pictures of what look like glaciers, and there are glaciers actually on the uh, on the flanks of what <coughs> look like glaciers on the flanks of the large volcanoes in Tharsis. So there is some indication of glaciation in, uh, in some places. Thank you. And David Hall, would you like to put your question? <clears throat> yeah, uh, uh, hello, yeah. My, my question is very simple, and that is, are we sure that Mars has always been in the same orbit, i.e. distance from the sun? I think I think we're pretty sure with respect to the times that we're talking about here. I mean, everything I mentioned here was 3.8 billion years and younger, and we're we're we're, we're pretty sure that that's that they've been in the same place since that time. All right, um, uh, Peter, you wanted to ask about uh, the the freezing time of the. Uh, of the oceans, I think. Would you like to... Yeah, just a quick question. Um, during your excellent lecture, you've used the term rapidly frozen uh, about a couple of times. How would you defer, uh, define rapidly frozen in terms of time? Okay, now the bit, um, there's been some work done by the, uh, on that. And see, what I, what I envisage is that uh, this this ocean was built up in layers each individual each individual flood you know created a new layer and so within a few thousand years th these layers may have been quite thick but within a few a sh geologically short period of time the uh, the the uh, the new layer would have uh, would have frozen excellent thank you Right, um, we have another question from Deepali, which I don't fully understand because I think um, precipitation was, I don't see why that shouldn't have happened on Mars. But uh, anyway, uh, Deepali, perhaps you'd like to put your question. Yeah, I'm just trying to visualize um, logically in my brain uh, the presence of the water in terms of. Um, you know how how it got there in the first place because um, either it was formed below the surface of Mars <clears throat> or it was brought to the surface of Mars and um, if it was brought to the surface of Mars um, it would have evaporated very fast because of the uh, lack of atmosphere uh, which is evidenced from the presence of all the craters because those craters were, were able to hit Mars because there was no uh, atmosphere to buffer those uh, 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 the, the objects hitting Mars. And so with a thinner atmosphere, uh, the presence of surface water is, is not something that, um, you know, th that's, that seems to um, be logical. So I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to um, visualize the whole process. Well, I think I mentioned earlier, I think the, 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 pre the water inventory comes from two sources, outgassing of the interior through volcanism and so forth. And 
the surf at the end, the cometary, cometary impacts. And um, it's the same with the Earth. I don't, I'm not sure what the, what the conflict is here. Why? Well, do you, have, do, you um, have a same, do you have a similar, do you have a similar problem with the Earth? Where its water came from? Well, yes, but I mean, I, I'm assuming that, um, well, I've moved in terms of the time scale of Earth, if, I, if I'm looking at the Earth in its present state, um, the presence of oceans and surface water <clears throat> is possible <clears throat> because there isn't a rapid evaporation that, make, that would make it uh, lose all that water because of the presence of the atmosphere. Whereas on Mars, um, you know, looking at the time, the present time frame, forgetting about the source of, you know, the water, um, the presence of surface water doesn't seem compatible with the state of the atmosphere in Mars. I'm not sure if um, well, I've uh, conveyed uh, my... Well, uh, f f first, uh, well, <laughs> I'm... Uh, look at present day Mars, the loss of water to space is very low. Despite the thinness of the atmosphere, there's only a hundred, it's only 10 precipitable microns in the, in the atmosphere. It's a thin atmosphere, very thin atmosphere, but little or no subli sublimation. I mean, there's just a very little water in the, in the, in the atmosphere. So the, the, um, the, uh, absence of an atmosphere doesn't mean lots of evaporation um, because it, the surface would freeze and uh, and uh, the distance from Mars from the from the sun makes uh, surface temperatures very low and the um, and, and the sublimation rates very very small um, I'd like to put a question um, how do we know about the changing obliquity of Mars over these over these time periods. The um, the uh, changes in obliquity are caused by the torques by the other planets on on the uh, on Mars itself. Mars is a very uneven gravity field. And uh, so the uh, the pull of the other planets, as it were, uh, as they move around the sun, uh, uh, puts torques on the uh, on the um, uh, on the spin, uh, affects the spin. The uh, Earth is largely this affects the Earth hardly at all because of the Earth's moon. The Earth's Earth moon stabilizes the obliquity of the Earth. But that's but Mars has only two very small moons, and uh, it doesn't. It, uh, so it it, it it lacks the stabilizing effect of the uh, 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 of the moon. Now the calculations going back in time are um, a, 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 a very a, a difficult and very um, very dependent on the initial the initial starting point of the uh, of the calculations, and I mentioned that this group. Well, Lascar et al. They did Monte Carlo simulations, thousands of them, to 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 uh, to see what the distribution of obliquity would be uh, back in time, and I showed the results of the, of those Monte Carlo calculations uh, in the slides. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Well, I, we don't have any more questions. I'll just just check. No. So we. We've come to the end of this uh, really fascinating talk. I mean, I think in my case, I just had a vague idea of a warm, wet, early Mars and oceans, and, and then the water was lost. But we've we've received um, we've learned so much more than that now. Um, how the water has moved through Mars, how it can be exchanged between the poles, uh, groundwater movements, the effect of um, impacts and volcanism. So I think this has been a, a fascinating tour through the 
likely history of Mars, and I'd like as many of you as possible to unmute and show your appreciation to uh, uh, Michael Carr, please. 